it is Marie here for the Quarantine Diaries. Day 13, April, April the 7th, Tuesday, that's what it is today. And guess what? It shows you how onto it we all were yesterday and so excited to be talking to Susie Brown that I realised when I was typing up this morning that I called um, yesterday day 11 when in fact it was day 12. And none of us picked it up until I picked it up this morning. So it just shows you how sort of every day is just sort of one is blending into another. Um, but it's actually been quite good. You know, it's been a really good thing to uh, get things done and moving in and out. And uh, we, I mean, wasn't there some some hope yesterday? We saw that um, the, the things are starting to, to flatten. We, we're seeing the benefits of uh, the measures that have been taken. So that is actually really, really heartening. And of course, for those who have uh, smaller ones at home, the fact that the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy are considered essential workers, which I know for many families that was quite important. So yeah, there was some nice levity to be had uh, yesterday. So I thought, you know, you've got to celebrate these wins, don't you? You never quite know. So. I have been sort of tracking along. Um, I'm not getting as much time to knit as I would like, if I am brutally, brutally honest. Um, I'm sort of working out here in my glorified she shed uh, for, you know, sort of around six to six to seven hours per day. And my entire plans of having loads of time swanning around, binging Netflix, drinking far too much coffee, then morphing off into Chardonnay and then knitting um, haven't actually come to the fruition that I had kind of hoped for. But, you know, that's right. That's just fine because I've also managed to do a whole bunch of other things uh, like help keep things tracking along at, at the online store. And things there are going. Da Damien tells me he had a fantastic day yesterday. He really got things um, rocking along. So uh, I think, I mean, we are running at about five, to, four to five days behind because it is just sort of him. Uh, but it's it's okay. It's things that he, he said he, he felt like he was starting to catch up yesterday. So uh, if you are waiting for orders, just be patient. And also too, then are now a number of other businesses uh, who have got that permission to trade and they are also trading. So, which is really, really great to see. Great to see that um, that those supplies are getting out there to those that need them just to keep us you know keep our heads straight on when or our heads straight you know while we're all feeling a bit bleh at this time so I'm going to kick off this morning I've got a few things to talk about today it's sort of it's a bit sort of hodgepodgey um, but I want to first to give you the progress for my rambler. I did, so the time that I'm finding to knit, funnily enough, is a first thing in the morning. I am not a super, super early riser, but I'm a um, early-ish riser. So I am, and, and I've sort of not really fallen into the whole sleep in thing while this quarantine is on. So I've been sort of waking at around the normal time, around 6-ish, 5 ish which is when I wake up. Um, and that's when I've been doing my knitting. So I've been having me quiet coffee and, and doing my knitting at that time. With me pooch and, and, you know, just chilling out. So I have made a little bit more progress from what I showed you yesterday. So I've now completed the central section with the Noro. And as you can see, there is that sort of graduation of colour there with the Noro, you can sort of see the sort of striping there as the Noro colours change. And I'm actually going to spin it round a little bit just to show you how those colours do change because particularly, where's the end there? So you can sort of see it there. See how the, it was quite, that torpy sort of mustard colour was quite, you know, did actually become quite noticeable. And I knew I was going to get sort of a level of striping in there, but I wanted to keep it so it was sort of added to the feature of the colour. Now, bearing in mind that the whole project has been built around this section of colour through the centre of the, the Noro. So the big decision that I had to make today, because I struck it today, there, so there were two. One, you'll see um, that sort of the, the musty colour come out there. And it actually came out right at the tips of the daring from Little Bandit there. So I kind of, I actually kind of like that. Like it sort of added a, a sort of, yes, this is where it is. And it didn't, I, for me, that I found that quite comforting. Um, so I kept it. But as the colour transitioned from the, before it got to that point, and it transitioned from the sort of uh, soft green into that ochre sort of a colour, there was a section of colour that was quite muddy looking. 
and I mean that's just color for you I mean that's color theory you know how, how colors work and it, and it was quite a muddy section of color and and to be honest with you I sort of knit about that far of the row as we were heading into this color and and the color was getting from that lovely vibrant kind of um it had gone from the vibrant um sort of soft minty green into this section here and I was like mm -hmm. so tinked it back and then got got my ball out and then started whipping ripping out this part until the ochre started to, to become a little bit more prominent like the ochre of the daring and that's when I sort of stopped and then rejoined the two together now if you think geez geez Louise why are you doing that um you know with that yarn that's so precious I'm not panicked about that I'll tell you why in a second um, but the nice thing about Noro, when I find the end of this, when I find the end, there it is. So Noro is actually, um, it is actually subtly a two-fold twist. It's wool and spun, which I explained, but see, there you go. See if I'm pulling there? See there? It is a two-fold twist, which helps with its strength, but it is not super, super strong. All right? But when it comes to doing wheat or felted joining, <laughs> peas and carrots really easy so actually ripping it rejoining it it's completely invisible you'd, you'd never see and the color graduations are thus and narrow that they are sort of these kind of really fluid sort of color changes that because I've actually whopped the section out but I did keep some of the ochre there it actually it, it, you you know, you know you're not going to notice it it's not going to be something that's completely noticeable but it took that muddy section out so that was yesterday and then today as I was continuing on so I'm just going to flick around and show you the floats at the back because you can see this more at the back so as you can see there's my floats actually quite proud of these Ethan they're not bad for me um, and then you can see the section there obviously where I'm just working row straight and there's the front there again um, then this morning as I was heading so I'm now back to two color again back with my daring um, I then came into this section which is the one I talked about the other day that I just wasn't too sure I, was, I think it was the Saturday week ago when I was talking with Ethan I wasn't too sure whether or not I'd keep this section in and you can see so I was working away and I got to it there and I could see it was starting to darken off and I thought yeah, yeah. no so I've pulled that out so I was in the blue section started going to blue black I sort of had a few sort of half a dozen stitches in blue back and then what I'd done is I'd pulled that out and when it went from blue black it then moved from to black oh make sure I'm just trying to do this because every time I pick this up the needles oh they no and I've done it <laughs> I'm just going to hold this very careful because all the needles have popped off then it popped off to this turquoise and went turquoise black and I felt it joined there and I am just going to do this before all my stitches go west and all my floats go west and before some little bright spark puts up in there and goes, Marie, you should put a needle protector on the end of that. Oh, no. Oh, no. But, you know, I'm not as organized as I'd like to think that I am. Right, there we go. Now, I have to also say welcome. There are a lot of new viewers that we've not had here before. Um, I noticed that particularly over on YouTube, um, our grower num our viewer numbers are growing there quite significantly. Um, so thank you for everyone that's joined and subscribed over there. And also thank you to everyone that is tuning in across on this side as well, whether it be here in regular Skeins Facebook Live or you remember the speakers and you've just joined that as well. Um, so great to have you and, and that I can help distract you for a little bit each day um, many of you are in the US or places far flung so welcome to you guys because um, I guess this is sort of afternoon for many of you uh, yes yeah, so that's where I'm at with the Rambler um, so it's really nice to have you on board and even if I entertain you just with my crazy accent for half an hour that's just fine uh, now back to these two scrappy pieces here these are not being thrown away because once I get through and complete that project, I am, I know 
because I'm now just at the second half, I'm still going to have a significant amount of this left. The rate I'm going, I'm going to be able to do a cowl and a hat, uh, which I might very well do. But I have held on to these because, like, particularly if I'm going to do a hat, and again, I am the world's worst, I know, because I don't put patterns in the things, because I make things, I make shit up as I go along, right? I can't help myself. Um, so I'll probably do a hat that I'll make up, um, because I just make stuff up. Uh, and see, that black section there, with all that black, with the South Under Sports, see, don't those two, aren't these, aren't they happy? They're happy together. So this is perfect to see so like so so for example to actually alternate or even double strand it to be perfectly honest in the ribbing to get a nice firm ribbing um but putting those guys together i think in the ribbing section would look actually incredible really really good nice focal point and then i will probably end up doing something because i know that i'm going to end up with this leftover as well um with that and then see look at that see don't they work well together so don't throw these little bits away you know, absolutely no reason. I don't know whether or not I will do another diamond colour work pattern like I've done there. I think the stranding will drive me crazy. But I might actually end up doing something modular with these, just a slip stitch situation um, with them. I don't know. I haven't really decided. Um, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But don't throw those bits away. I mean, just because the, you will be able to use them, you will be able to utilise them. And, uh, you know, at the moment, we're not wanting to waste anything, are we? So... So those are have what I've done with that. I'm kind of hoping that, you know, if I get a bit of time to be through that colour section, because once I get through the colour section, I know the rest of it's going to rip away quite quickly and, and I can really get on to the main body, which is nice and mindless, which I'm quite looking forward to. Uh, so that's where I'm at with my Rambler. Now, what I was wanting to talk about today, though, was because uh, I was digging around in my, round by the side of my chair down there and one of the things that um i was thinking about the other day was we were talking about ethan and i were talking about just um all the different things we do and we have things like um revelry which we use all the time and sometimes it's nice to reflect back and look at books and magazines and different things that we've had now if you're somebody like me uh, who is always making stuff up and I have a tendency to make these things up um, and generally Chardonnay is involved so I have often joked that I do d designs by Chardonnay and so I got to what I d will do though in my defense is I will actually scratch down some rudimentary notes about where I'm at and what I'm doing. Now I know at the beginning of the year in the speakeasy I saw and I, this year and last year a number of you were talking about starting project diaries. So an actual physical project diary. So Ravelry is a digital project diary. You can pop all your notes there and people can share and you can and I mean let's face it as a resource Ravelry is fantastic and we all use it and love it but sometimes it's actually nice to have something a little bit more tactile and to hand and I have seen so if any of you have done this because I know I'm sure someone I've got a sneaking suspicion I don't know whether it's you Jeanette or Dell someone has, is doing this are doing these project diaries and they create have a notebook something similar to this and you're writing down notes of what the project is where the pattern is who it's by um, if it's available on Ravelry and you're then also attaching or stapling to it samples of the yarns that you might use. So then that way you've sort of got a record of what you're doing. Now I have seen at Nut August Nights, and I'm really sorry um, because the name, your name has just gone, pew, but at Nut August Nights last year I think it was or it may have been the year before I had a trader just in on the Sunday and they'd created these incredible little message cards um, printed cards that were sort of pretty much for almost exactly that purpose so they were a way of logging uh, you'd put a little tuft of yarn around the card and then you would actually put on the card notes of what you knitted in that yarn how much you used where it was possibly stored and, and what have you and and then it could have and it was indexable you could sort of have it a bit like an index system it was really really clever um but i did start now i started this a long long time ago and actually the very first pattern that's on here is a shrug that i knitted for a wee lassie now when i knitted this for this girl i think she was two or three years old she's now at high school so it shows you how 
how old that's been. Um, and so I did spend a lot of time. I, I can put you've gotten. I had actually started this and writing stuff down. But I do actually still use it because every now and then someone will ask me to make something like my dad needed a vest, you know, so I'll write down measurements. Um, I'll put people's measurements in here. I'll put down a basic idea for something. Project Runway, this is not people. It's me. But I know what I'm doing. Um, actually, the poncho that I'm, see, the poncho that I've now knitted three times that I've shown you with Stephen, that's my notes there. Trust me, Ethan, that's probably as good as you're going to get when I finally give this to you to write up for me. Um, look, here you go, with more notes. Complete with when I took, knocked it over and took my red wine on the, um, the page. You know, I'm just classy. Class act, me. Class act. But these diaries are really, really useful. Really useful. And, uh, and so I do, yes, from time to time I do still do it. Now, if I'm entirely, entirely honest, what I do do more, hand, more though, is I am a prolific list maker. So any of those who have worked with me, whether it be at Can or at Skeins, um, knows this about me. And I have always got uh, one of these diaries. This is a Can one that I have here. I've got a little unwind one I've had for a couple of years at work and I am forever making, so there you go, there's today's show, um, I am forever making lists. So that is, that's me. And so I'm always writing stuff down and I keep these little note knocks because I'm always jotting stuff down and I can go back and refer to them. And it's not that I don't use digital things to record stuff, I do. Uh, I just find that sometimes I like, I like going old school, I like having a pencil and I just like writing the tact, tactile nature of writing stuff down. Call me crazy, but it's me. Uh, so, the, but then, I'm just going to jump down here and just make see how we, oh gosh, everyone's here this morning. Morning, guys. Wow. Um, thank you, uh, Eleanor. She's saying that I look stunning in the autumn colours. Can I tell you a quick thing about this before we get going? had a phone call with my cousin this morning. Um, I have numerous cousins, so I'm not going to name and shame her, but, you know, though <laughs> she knows who she is. Anyway, we were talking about a few different bits and pieces, but <laughs> she has a particular aversion to my grey hat, and she said to me, no, the grey hat's not working. <laughs> she said, the grey hat's not working, Marie. So this one, I haven't worn this one today. Look, just for you. I told you I was going to dig a new one out just for you today. And this one is the same pattern. It's that uh, sort of simple beret. It's the same pattern as this one here. It's a pattern I've been playing around with for a number of years. Um, this is actually my favourite when I've got a single rogue skein or part skein um, of something lurking around and I don't have a huge amount of it. So this is actually a Malabrigo that I was gifted, I think, in a swap years ago um and yeah being a redhead uh even more bent of these days but uh, yeah autumn colors and me are friends so uh yeah so i have to admit i love this and this i'm going to talk about this because i talked about this before in previous videos you but for those newbies um this is niada by uh, martina bean and as you know i'm a huge fan girl of martina i have multiple projects um, of her designs. Uh, Hitchhiker being the most famous that she has done. Uh, Lefty is another favourite of hers that I like. I've also done a few Brickless, but Niada is my absolute number one favourite. Um, but this yarn is uh, homespun. I spun this. This is homespun um, and this is Happy Go Knit. Uh, not Happy Go Knitty, sorry. It is Fibre to go, Lynn, I am so sorry. Fibre to go, Lynn Walsh, um, and it is a uh, merino silk. Lynn has got the most beautiful, she's got this really wonderful eye for colour that I adore, um, and I buy them in lovely braids, and she comes to knit August nights every year. And So I have to admit, not that I buy a huge amount of yarn um, anymore, but one of the things I nearly always end up doing is buying a braid. Um, to do some spinning from Lynn. So that's what that is. Right, where was I before I got distracted? Now I'm just going to talk to my friend down here. You are going to be quiet, aren't you, on your mat? Thank you. He cries. Oh, actually, he barks. Yesterday, at the he sat outside the door at the end of the broadcast and just barked until I let him in. I tell you what, these, these fur children, they seem to try you. Right, now, digital. So we're talking about 
was I talking about? I was talking about uh, recording and writing stuff down. So when you record and write stuff down, um, you've got everything there. The other place, obviously, that we like to share and record things are in the Facebook or different messenger groups or Instagram or all those different places that, that we have. And, and we share things there all the time and we just absolutely love it. And so you've got all these amazing projects and not every, and let's face it, not everybody will go into Ravelry and load the project up and put everything in there. I mean, you just don't. Do you? I have to admit, I had a little bit of a catch up on some of the projects a little while ago, and I actually went in and started catching up on doing those in Ravelry a wee, wee, bit, a wee bit ago. And I mean, I, there were so many that I was like, oh, that's right, I didn't put that one in. Oh, I've already gifted it or given it away. Or seen, you know, so it had gotten missed. So one of the little um, brainwaves that I suddenly thought that you could possibly do, and it's a really nice little project to do. Why you're at home and you can't get out and you're on devices or laptops or the tablets and the like is that there are a whole heap of products, actually digital products, out there in terms of creating photo books. And a lot of them, the software on the stuff now has improved dramatically. Now, I've always had a keen interest in photography. And of course, when you have small children, you're always taking pictures of the kids and you're doing together stuff for grandparents and things like that. So I remember ages ago, particularly when digital digital photography um, was becoming more than um, the norm from film photography, is that you could then go to uh, your, this is when you were still actually getting prints printed out. I mean, gosh, who does that now? But you would go to the, the photo booth, whether it be wherever it was, the Photoshop, the chemist, the supermarket, and they would have your little kiosk and you'd put your stuff in and you could create these photo books at the kiosk and, and they were a bit rudimentary, but you could create these little brag books for grandparents and friends and yourself as a record or as a way to get these images printed. Um, well, the technology has moved on so much now that you can actually do it all from your device. There are either apps or, or even in, um, you just click on a, uh, an ad within Facebook and it all sucks it all in and, and does it for you. There's a whole heap of them and they really are quite fantastic. They're very, very easy to use. And a lot of them will draw images either directly down from Facebook or Instagram, or you can send it to a certain gallery. There's a whole different ways that you can do it. But I have to admit, I'm quite fond of them and I've been using them off and on over a number of years as a way to, um, for our travels and holidays as a family, to, that if we were to go away on holiday, the old days of sitting down and pulling a scrapbook together have long gone, but it's quite easy that if you've been away, I can go and suck all the images down of whatever that is and then get a book done up. And they vary in price. I mean, they're not, I mean, I won't lie to you. I mean, we're not talking, um, it's only going to be a couple of dollars. Sometimes, depending on the number of images that you have, you could be spending anywhere from 15 to $50 um, to actually get something created. But I'm a firm, firm believer that if you're actually getting it in hard copy, you're more likely to go back and refer to it and actually have it to be able to show people when people come over than trying to than necessarily handing them a tablet. And it's actually really nice to have that, again, tactile object. So uh, this is a really good example of what I'm talking about. So this is one that I did. Uh, I did this over the January holidays. So this is one for our 2019 year. Um, and it basically covers off everything that we did. And actually, that is perfect. I'm going to show you guys this. Yes, from there. And I mean, you don't have to put all the images, but this is a really good idea. This is a good example of the things that they've done. So this one here is I do Christmas nuts every year. So people that um, follow me on Instagram know, know about those that I do. But then the next images are from um, Tan, um, Tan Wan Court in uh, Victoria. And the nice thing, now what I haven't done is I'll, I have done in previous books, I've bought like a silver Sharpie and I've actually just gone through and written on what these places are and where, where they are. But this um, was from our cruise, the, uh, the can cruise that we had, oops, that way. And these are all pictures from Tandy, which were just, you know, really fantastic. And these are some more images from, oops, I'm going to get this camera sorted, there we go, uh, from the cruise. And it's just a really, really nice way to actually record it. But I was thinking about it. It just doesn't have to be your travels or the kids or everyday life. You could actually do that for your knitting projects. 
So while you've got all these projects and things there, this is actually a really nice way to record them. You can take photographs of what you've worked on. You can even take photographs of the yarn that you've done, have them all there, suck them all up into the um, into the software and then actually get them printed out. So you've actually got a log and an actual book or diary of all those things that you've worked on. I just think that it's a really fantastic idea. That one particular one I did through past books, um, P-A-S-T books, uh, which I found on Facebook. But I have traditionally prior to that done, uh, especially if I'm sharing them, because they, to be fair, this was about for fifty dollars, I think this is at the high age. But as you can see, it's hard copy bound and quite thick. So, but I have done these little guys here, and this was a little brag book that I produced um, a few years ago for uh, for the grandparents, and and it's essentially images of primarily the grandkids, um, but they're all just it's almost pretty singularly let's find you there we go that's a good one so it's just it's, and, my, and these ones have all been drawn down from instagram so these are all from my um instagram profile and this one i did on vista print um and i quite like it because it's square it's little it's you know, easy to keep a track of, um, but it's just, and, and actually this was surprisingly inexpensive to do, so that was Vista Print. Um, but I also note that Warehouse, it's, uh, Warehouse Stationery also have an app online that you can get and you can make books like that, and so does um, Harvey Norman. Um, I think one is called Printacular, and I can't quite remember what the other one is, but the resources are out there, and while we've got the time and we're sitting in our chairs with our devices, that could be actually something that you might want to look up and have a look. I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's a fun, nice thing to do. And it's uh, a good, good way of recording where you're at and actually having it in tactile form. So you might prefer to do a diary, you might prefer to write notes, or you might prefer to do that. So yeah, so that, I thought that would be something that would be quite fun. Right, how, how else? I'm just checking down all it. Um, what have we got here? Oh, Kirsten, it's so nice that someone's not working. She's able to watch live. I'm so glad that you've been able to do that. Ah, uh, oh, and Cheryl is saying first she's um, knitting Floozy 2, first time doing colour work. Cheryl, you've chosen a fantastic pattern um, for your first time in colour work uh, because both Floozy and Floozy 2, which are done by Libby Johnson, a.k.a. Truly Myrtle, are... Uh, the perfect beginner colour work pattern because they're slip stitch colour work. Nice and easy. You're not having to panic about floats. It's a really lovely, she's got beautiful proportions with the colour and Libby is, um, the patterns are always stunningly written and yeah, it's such a, such a perfect beginner's pattern. I think it's well done. Um, make sure you post that over in the speakeasy so we can see how you're getting on. Uh, Hello to everybody. Oh, good. It's got so good to see all our regulars here. It's fantastic. Right, everyone. Let's. I'm going to show you. Well, no, what else did I talk about? Oh, that's right. I promised. Oh, there we go. Helen says she thinks fish pond photo do books as well. Thank you, Helen. Um, actually, that's why I was. That's where the segue was. I knew I had a segue to this. So the other thing I did is I jumped on and had a look where. Uh, what people were posting in the speakeasy. So our th theme this month is binge, uh, and it's what you're binging on, what you're knitting, what you're watching, what you're doing. And just having a quick glance uh, before I, I was having a look last night, and then I had another quick glance this morning. There are some incredible projects, and this is the first one I want to show you because Easter is like, suddenly, it suddenly dawned on me, Easter's this weekend. When did that happen? And look at this. This is from Carol Krebs. She put this up this morning. I know we're going to get reflection from my phone, but so these are, if you're not in the speakeasy, these are all over in the speakeasy. Look at that. Look at that bunny. 
so cute. Now, she said it's called uh, something bunny in a box, but go over and have a speakeasy. But I just thought he was so cute. And you know what I love about that, Carol? I don't know what the yarn you used on that was. But what I like about that is it's obviously, it doesn't take a huge amount of yarn. It's yarn that sort of graduates and changes in colour. Perfect for using those scraps and bits and stash. I just think, I think it's an absolute cracker. She does refer to what the pattern is over on her post. Now, this was the other one that I pulled up this morning as well. This is from Helen um, Hakariah Gorge, uh, George, rather. Sorry, Helen. And that, and I'm just going to, is it going to let me flip it around? It's going to let me flip, yeah, there it goes. No, okay, so we'll go back that way. So that is her exploration station. She said she's been working on it uh, since February, but don't those colours look fantastic? I love the fact that you've chosen um, such bright, vibrant colours, Helen, and it looks amazing. And see the black that you've done for the to break up the separate wedges, but also for that final border, I think just pulls it all together. I'm, I really absolutely love it. And she also posted in there how much she had left over. So she's got so, so much left over. No, you can stay in here. You're not going back out. Now you come back over on your mat. Thank you, mister. Come on, over here, mate. It's because he's heard his father come home and he wants to, he's now decided his father's more exciting than me. <laughs> tush, tush, dogs. Right, uh, the next one I also then saw was from Helen Thompson. Now, the reason I showed Explor Exploration Station is because we had the conversation with Ethan from Outlaw Yarns on Saturday and everything we talked about on Saturday was uh, Stephen West and so that is from Exploration Station from Stephen West but this was the other one we also talked about and in fact Ethan um, had this project let's do that so we can see it we're gonna oh there we go and that is the Orfeo Cow by Amy Vandela, and she has gone and done that in the, oh, see, I think it was actually probably better that way. The reflection's not flash, but there you go. Um, now that is done in the, it's the Outlaw Bohemia Sport. I think the colour is in, oh no, it could be London Town actually, that dark colour, isn't it? London Town. And the orange is actually, and I remember this, that orange is one that we had, it's a twist on twist, same construction as of Orb, you were lucky to get that, you were, and it's, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head now, but it was one that we did, it was a possum merino, and we had some singles of it that uh, we had been given by another domestic mill here in New Zealand, and they weren't quite sure what to do with it, and so we twisted off, uh, we had two lots of it, the orange, and there was another green, a really lovely, rich, mossy green, and we only had a four ply and a DK, and a very small amount of it in the shop, and uh, you are very lucky because that one never went online. So that tells me you definitely came to visit. Um, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. But that cow, I just love that cow because it works so fantastically well with those contrasting colours. And also she posted a second one of those as well, just showing different colours and what you can do. So keep posting up um, what you're doing. A number of you also posted up the books that you're reading, the things that you're binge watching on TV and um, the like. So that is fabulous loving it now last but not least oh yeah gosh i'm already over half an hour and i thought today would be short um i did post up last night on uh instagram and facebook again i finally managed to uh do a, some cooking take a photograph and actually bring you a recipe um We've, we've got a order of, I'm not going to, haven't been to the supermarket yet. I've literally only just been down the road to our local four square. So I've not been to the big supermarket, just our little one down the road. Uh, so I've sort of done quite well. I've been ordering in um, from services as much as I can to reduce the amount of going out um, during this time. But uh, I know I've got meat coming, which hopefully will be here today. But in the meantime, so I was sort of down to digging things around out in the freezer. And I don't have a huge freezer, just your standard sort of fridge freezer that you have in most houses. So I don't have a separate big freezer at all. So we, uh, last night, it was like, oh, okay, what are we going to, it was a bit like culinary, culinary challenge. And one of the things that I had in the freezer was uh, part, half a bag, just a half a small little bag of um, frozen prawns, um, just the little, you know, cooked cook prawns um, and I know many of us probably have one of those lurking around in our freezers 
And I thought, ah, I know what I'm going to do. And it was just a very simple pasta recipe, which I've got a funny feeling. Um, and in fact, well, I do know that Jamie Oliver has done something very similar um, to this in the early years of uh, Naked Chef. Um, and in fact, I think it's in one of his first two or three books and he's revised it many times since. But pasta is easy. It's certainly something that you can whip up incredibly quickly. And my boys are both very interested in the kitchen, and the youngest especially, he wanted to um, give me a hand with dinner last night. So this pasta dish was great because I could get him involved in cooking dinner, and he could actually do the large majority of it himself. So I call it freezer pasta, um, and it was for me. It was two bulbs of garlic or a teaspoon of crushed garlic if you're using it from the jar. Um, some I used thyme, pizza thyme, in fact, because that's what I had in the garden. But any sort of woodyish herb would do if you if you've got access to it so in your garden if you've got thyme uh, marjoram um oregano even a little bit of ro rosemary would work but just some sort of woody um herb in there and about sort of a teaspoon's worth of fresh herb if you don't have any fresh herb and you've only got dried uh, time I think is probably the best for this and I would use about a um, quarter to half a teaspoon of dried herb uh, and then I just and then if you've got um, we've got a small lemon tree so I had a couple of lemons and I just had a only a little tiddler it wasn't a big one but the zest of a small lemon and I just pop that in a, um, some oil just to sort of um, lightly cook that off and to that I added my frozen uh, prawns which had been thawed and I think in all told, the little half bag ended up being about one and a half, but not quite two cups of prawns. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, frozen prawns. Like if you don't, this is, this is the optional part. If you're a vegetarian, don't do the meat part at all. If you are uh, someone who, you are a meat eater and, and, and it doesn't bother you. Actually, if you're a vegetarian, i tell you what you can do. Um, so if you've got sun-dried tomatoes, that works very well, actually, as an alternative um, to add that depth of flavour. Uh, or a, um, a olives, Kalamata olives actually work quite well as an alternative. You can use bacon if that's what you've got. If you've got old chunks of ham, use that. If you've got that one lonely last cooked sausage that you've got from the night before, chop that up into small pieces and put that in there. If you've got chorizo sausage, even better. If you've got that half packet of sliced Italian pepperoni slash Danish um, salami or whatever it is sitting around in the deli drawer in your fridge that's been there for you know probably a bit longer than it should um, chop that up finely and put that in it's just a small amount of something because what you're wanting is a carrying a flavor you're wanting something to imbibe flavor into the pasta because the star of the show is the pasta it's not the sauce so whatever you've got that's that's what you use. So in my case, it was prawns, but it could be any of those other things above. Uh, I also did, like for us, we did an entire 500 gram pack of pasta because there's me, my husband, and I've got essentially two teenage boys that eat more than my husband and I put together. So I used a, a full pack because that's what we need for a meal for that lot. So once I've cooked down um, the meat component and warmed that through, We'd had uh, peas and carrots with roast chicken the night before, so I had a small bowl left over of peas and um, just peas and carrots that I cut up. Well, they went in, so frozen peas and some um, uh, carrots, so that went in. So again, if you've got anything like peas, carrots, um, green beans, um, capsicum would work equally as well. Um, if you've got those little steam fresh packets from the, uh, in the sitting in the freezer that you've bought from the, a packet of that would work really well so pop that in as a vegetable element make sure everything is all heated through because it's most of the stuff i'm adding is already cooked so it just needs to be well heated through get that all heated through make sure this it's definitely sizzling and then it's a good dollop of cream like a good chunk of cream if you've got it again not essential but if you've got some cream Add that in there now. And what that does is it starts to give you a nice creation for a sauce. If you don't have any cream, um, you can actually use a bit of stock. Uh, so you've just got a little bit of wetness, a little bit of stock, and or you could actually add in some stock with a generous knob of butter. So you're just essentially wanting to create something that will give you a bit of a sauce so you can actually get that coated over the pasta. 
add that in there, give that all a mix up until it's nice and cooked. The entire time you've been doing that, you've had your pasta cooking in a pot next to you. Once that's cooked, pull that out, drain it, and straight into that uh, dish with um, all your saucy bits in there. Mix it around, and also, if it's looking a little touch dry, I just add, hold back a little bit of that pasta water and add that back in there. And that will actually, because there's starches in that water, and it will actually just sort of help pull everything together. But don't get too fussy about it. And then I've just got a big shallow bowl, and all of that just gets dumped out into that bowl. Um, and then I sort of redistribute the chunky bits around the pasta just to make sure it's evenly distributed. Now, the trick before you serve it, two things. One, that lemon that you'd zested before, cut that in half and squeeze that lemon over the top. It just elevates and lifts the flavours of that pasta no end. So that is trick one. Trick two is you need to season this well. It is not the time to be worried about the salt police, people. You, a generous amount of salt and pepper on the top of that and mix it through. It makes all the difference. It really, really does. It helps elevate those flavours. As you may have noticed, I haven't added salt at any other part of the time. Obviously, you cook your pasta in salted water, but that salt really does make a difference to actually elevate the flavour of your pasta. And then if you want to add uh, any other toppings like cheese or... Uh, um, sprinkle some toasted seeds or whatever it is you can do that um, afterwards as well but something like that is super super simple my little bloke he's in fact he's 12 on Thursday it's very exciting for him um, he was the one that made most of that last night he chopped, chopped most of everything went through the cooking and yeah and he absolutely loved it so it was a really really fun fun thing to do so before you actually ask Maria are you going to type that recipe up and put it in the comments the short answer to that is no you can now torture everybody in your household and put this video up next to the stove or the bench and play it back and torture everyone with me telling you how to cook a pasta recipe. If you're really nice, you can put some headphones in, but no, I'm not going to write it out. You can listen to it. I'm lazy and I've got loads to do. Um, so today, today's cooking is hot cross buns because they haven't had hot cross buns at the full square in and we all felt like hot cross buns. <laughs> so we were really lucky that we managed to, we'd just in our regular last grocery shop, regular grocery shop before the craziness, um, we had actually just topped our yeast up. So we have some yeast. Um, don't come breaking down our door for yeast, people. Uh, so we do have, well, we have half a thing of yeast. And so we're going to use some of that on hot cross buns today. Uh, we in the bread maker, so that will be fun. I'm going to really enjoy that. And tomorrow, what have we got on tomorrow? Tomorrow I'm going to try and dig out something else to talk about. I'm sure I will find something. And then the day after that, I'm hoping to catch up with Stephen B. So I've already talked to him. So we can see what he's up to over in um, Minneapolis. And I'm also talking to some other people for next week as well. And remember, of course, Saturday we've always got Ethan. Yay. Till then, have a fantastic day. I've talked far, far too much. My coffee is cold. The dog's waiting to go out. And I'd like to do some knitting. And I'm sure you would too. So I will talk to you again tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.